Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's wonderful to be with all of you for this conversation in our series on faith and culture. And welcome to Riggs Library. We are so grateful to be joined this evening by acclaimed journalist and biographer, uh, Jonathan Eig, to discuss his newest book, King, A Life. A New York Times bestselling author, Jonathan has written six books on a broad range of topics from biographies of Lou Gehrig and Muhammad Ali to accounts of the criminal conviction of Al Capone and of feminist history in the 20th century. His work has been translated into more than a dozen languages. He's been listed among the best, his, his best books of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. John, I want to thank you for your time with us. We look forward to engaging your reflections in just a few moments. And joining Jonathan in conversation is Paul Eli, Senior Fellow at our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, Director of our American Pilgrimage Project. Paul, we want to thank you for your dedication to curating this important series on behalf of our Georgetown community. Since 2008, these conversations have offered us an opportunity to welcome a number of distinguished individuals to Georgetown whose work engages the intersections of faith, culture, literature, and society. Our guests have included civil rights historian Taylor Branch, filmmaker Martin Scorsese, novelists Marilyn Robinson and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and poets Christian Wyman and Tracy K. Smith. As I said, tonight we're honored to welcome Jonathan Eig, the author of King A Life, the most significant biography of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. since David Garrow's Bearing the Cross, published in 1986, and Taylor Branch's trilogy, America in the King Years, completed in 2006. King A Life invites us to consider the transformative impact of Dr. King through a holistic engagement with his life and legacy, as Jonathan explains, and I quote, today King's words might help us make our way through these troubled times, but only if we actually read them, only if we embrace the complicated King, the flawed King, the human King, the radical King, only if we see and hear him clearly again as America saw and heard him once before, close quote. Through meticulous research and compelling new insights, Jonathan takes us on a sweeping journey through Dr. King's life as a student, a pastor, a civil rights leader, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, and after his assassination, a revered, a revered figure in our nation's history. He also explores Dr. King's more complex interior formation, his relationships with his family and friends, contemporary activists, government officials, to reveal a profile that the New York Times describes as, quote, very human and quite humane. By weaving together both Dr. King's celebrated leadership and his personal life, Jonathan enables us to more deeply understand Dr. King's impact on American culture and his legacy in our current moment. King of Life has been recognized for its extraordinary contributions. It was nominated for the 2023 National Book Award for Nonfiction, a finalist for the 2023 National Book Critics Circle Award. It was awarded the New York Historical Society's 2024 Barbara and David Zaluznik Book Prize, presented annually to the nation's best work of history or biography. So, John, we're honored to welcome you for this conversation. We want to thank you for sharing this time with us. And again, to join Jonathan in conversation, we're pleased to have distinguished author, editor, member of our community, Paul Eli, who has facilitated our Faith and Culture Lecture Series since its, ince its inception more than 15 years ago. Paul is the author of The Life You Save May Be Your Own, a portrait of four 20th century Catholic Writers, which won the Penn Martha Albrin Award for First Nonfiction. He's also the author of Reinventing Bach. Both books were National Book Critics Circle Award finalists. His third book, The Last Supper, which considers the intersection of religion and the arts in the 1980s, will be published next spring. 
In addition, he's a regular contributor to The New Yorker, which has published many of his writings on topics such as Catholicism, the Vatican, and Pope Francis. And prior to his time at Georgetown, Paul worked in book publishing for many years as a senior editor at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Through his writings, his projects at the Berkeley Center, his leadership of our Faith and Culture series, Paul shares his remarkable spirit of inquiry and exploration with us as we examine the place of faith in contemporary society. So Jonathan and Paul, thank you for being with us this afternoon. We're all so looking forward to this interesting conversation that will unfold. And it's now my pleasure to turn this over to Paul and to John. Thank you. Thank you very much, President DeJoya. And uh, thank you to Tom Benchoff and colleagues at the Berkeley Center for all you've done to uh, make the event possible. Jonathan, thanks for coming. It's really a joy to have you here. And I've anticipated this conversation really since I began reading the biography last year after it was published. And, and it's deeply satisfying to have the chance to, to talk about the book with you. Thank thanks. you. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here. April 3rd, 1968 was a Wednesday. Rainy in Memphis. Martin Luther King was there. Uh, he was expected to speak at a church, and things got a little complicated. And uh, can you pick up the story from there? Wow, uh, things were often complicated for King, um, really his whole career. But on that date, the anniversary today, another rainy day, exactly. Um, I'm bad at math, 61 years ago? Uh, no, I'm just not even close. That's how bad at math I am. Um, someone help me out. But it's, he was in Memphis um, against the advice of most of his friends and advisors. For the last few years, he'd been really falling in popularity and the esteem and the respect of most Americans. Two thirds of Americans in a Gallup poll said they disapproved of Martin Luther King. That wasn't that they disapproved of his stance on the Vietnam War or they disapproved approved of his view on, um, on race and segregation. They just approved of Martin Luther King, period, two thirds of Americans. And nevertheless, he kept doubling down on his beliefs, on his Christian radicalism, that he had to speak up for the poor, that he had to speak up for the disenfranchised, that he had to attack Northern racism, that he had to speak out on the Vietnam War because his brothers in Vietnam were the same as his brothers in America. Um, and it wasn't going well. He was planning the biggest protest of his career, the Poor People's Campaign, basically Occupy Washington, DC. And while he's doing all of this, while he's struggling, and frankly, while he's probably you know, clinically depressed, he gets a call from his friend, James Lawson, one of the people I interviewed for my book, who said, will you come to Memphis? Because the sanitation workers are on strike. Um, Robert Walker and Echol Coles, two black men who worked at sanitation, um, men were crushed to death in the back of their truck because it was a pouring rain and they weren't allowed to sit in the front of the truck and they climbed in the back for shelter and the truck malfunctioned and killed them. And um, The workers were on strike over their poor pay and their poor working conditions and Reverend Lawson asked King if he'd come and King said, of course. Um, these are exactly the people that he's been talking about, the poor and the disenfranchised. So he came to Memphis, and the first march ended badly. It ended in violence, and he felt personally responsible and horrified because he preached nonviolence. Um, so he went back to Memphis again on April 3rd, 1968, hoping that he could lead a second march that would go more smoothly and would not result in violence. And when he got there, uh, there, was an, there was a court order banning him from marching, and they were trying to work that out. And the people were gathered at Mason Temple asking, uh, waiting for King to come speak. And it was a terrible night, thunderstorms, lightning. And um, King decided to stay in bed and um, sent Ralph Abernathy to speak on his, in his place. And when Abernathy got there and saw how many people were, were crowded there and how um, desperate they were to hear King's voice, he called back to the Lorraine Motel and said, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not the one they want to hear, Doc. You got to get out of bed. So King was literally in his pajamas and got dressed and went over there, and um, without any planning, gave a very unusual, 
kind of a sermon, an unusual kind of speech. It was proved to be the last speech of his life. And he often gave the same speech over and over again. And he loved being in the pulpit. And it wasn't ever wrote to him to give the same speech or the same sermon uh, multiple times because he found something new in it and he interpreted it differently each time. But this was a very different kind of speech for him, one that he'd never really given before. And he seemed to summarize his entire life's work. And he talked about the fact that he had been struggling. He talked about the fact that he had doubts, that he'd been stabbed in the chest um, a decade earlier and wondered what would have happened if he had died that day and all the things that he would have missed in his life and how difficult his life had been, but how he was so glad that he didn't miss all of these events of the last decade. And then he closed his speech by saying, I'd like to live a long life like anyone else, but longevity isn't everything. I just want to do God's work. I just want to do God's will. And I may not reach the promised land, but I know that together we as a people will reach the promised land. And um, he almost collapsed at the end of that speech into Ralph Abernathy's arms when he came off the stage. And you can watch it on YouTube and see that I'm not exaggerating. And Abernathy said he had never seen King that emotional. So that was the last speech. And the next day, we know what happened. It's a staggering moment. And I'm hearing you tell it. I'm staggered all over again. And one of the strengths of your book is that we, we feel the uh, combination of, we do feel that it, it's the last night of his life, but we also feel that it was just another night. He didn't know. Right. And the, um, the su surprise, the improvisatory quality of it, the fact that um, this night that's now canonical in the history of, of this country was a difficult time for him. And you, you were able to bring all that to bear on that scene, get, getting out of his pajamas and showing up into this crowded church and going off script. It, it's really extraordinary. And I, reading the book, I feel that, that that's, it's conclusive. And the, the, the breathtaking horror of what happened the next day um, isn't it, kind of the promised land of the book is right there where, where he articulates it so well. It's an extraordinary scene. And, and you know, I, I didn't, uh, I sprang this plan to open in, in this fashion on him 15 minutes ago. So you obviously know the material so well that you can just um, step up, not unlike the way he did. I tried to skim the book to prepare for this event. I could not do it. I reread the entire book in the last three days. That's how. Uh, how involving it is. And this is, I've read all three volumes of Branch, and I read um, uh, Garrow when it came out, and we know how the story ends. But that's how you were able to make this story um, uh, fresh is, 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 is one of the marvel, marvels of the book. So thanks just for that. Thank you. you it kind of got started here in DC uh, over a conversation. How did that happen? Yeah, it's, it really, the book really did have its origins here at a hotel. I wish I could remember the name of it. Um, I was having breakfast with Dick Gregory, interviewing him for my book about Muhammad Ali. And I wanted to know about the two occasions in which Ali and King met. And Gregory, of course, knew both of those men really well. And it was while I was talking to Dick Gregory that I just had this epiphany that there were still hundreds of people alive who knew King, and that I really should be, as soon as I finish this Ali book, I got to get started and just travel the country interviewing as many of these people as I could. And, and that was just the instinct that I had. I just got so excited in talking to Dick Gregory and realizing that this is someone who, who spent maybe hundreds of hours with King, just really knew him well. Um, and Gregory said to me, um, do you know the difference between Martin Luther King and Jesus? And if you don't know, if anybody in the audience doesn't know Dick Gregory, he's a comedian as well as an activist. So I thought this might be a, a gag. Like, that might be like a riddle of some kind. <laughs> so I said, no, what's the difference between Martin Luther King and Jesus? And he said, we've got videotape of Martin Luther King. <laughs> we got him on film. And I thought, wow, there's a lot to un think about there. But we, it's, we have more than film. We have living witnesses. And you're one of them. And that's when I decided I would spend the next six years of my life trying to interview as many of those people as I could. So 200 interviews, and many of these people um, becoming friends. One offered to cut your hair. <laughs> uh, then there's King's this barber, by the way. 
there's not this... just like random people <laughs> want to cut my hair. The, then there's this third dimension, which, in in a grim way, uh, we we have hundreds, many hundreds of hours of audio tape of King and his circle, um, because he was spied on, yeah. domestic spying by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. And to me, it's just a terrible irony that your book is invigorated by this um, documentary work that was done by the government, which, which made a public enemy of, of one of the great Americans. Uh, what, what's, what was that like to um, spend hours a day listening to King's of fairly ephemeral conversations, I imagine? Yeah. Um, terrible irony is exactly right. It's ironic that our government, the same government that now celebrates him with a national holiday, treated him as a, as a public enemy and, and labeled him America's most notorious liar and literally put in writing that he was the most dangerous man in America when it comes to race um, the day after the March on Washington. The March on Washington is what compelled the FBI to increase its surveillance because they, see it, they saw the potential he had to unite people and that was a threat. Why was that a threat? Because it posed a challenge to the people who were in power that they might have to share some of that power. That was the threat. It wasn't that Martin Luther King was, was, was un-American or that he was a communist, which is how they initially justified their, their surveillance. But the terrible irony is that reading the, the transcripts of his phone calls humanizes him now in a way that J. Edgar Hoover certainly never dreamed. He used that surveillance to try to destroy King, literally to try to destroy him. At one point, they took a compilation of the recordings they had made from in his hotel rooms, and they mailed it to his home and his office so that, hoping that Coretta would hear it and would divorce him, and that his reputation would be destroyed. They sent those tapes to reporters, too, shared them um, with members of Congress, with the president. And there hoping, was an even darker goal, right? Yeah, to drive him to suicide. The letter that was accompanied the package sent to his home included a letter that was purported to have been written by an angry black man, but was actually written by Assistant Director William Sullivan of the FBI. And that letter said, we know what you're doing. You're going to be exposed. The only way out for you is suicide. And they gave him a date by which they expected him. Christmas or something like that. Right? Uh, it, was a, um, it was right around Christmas, right? Um, so the government is seeking to destroy him. And they're actually quite effective in damaging his reputation, in disrupting the civil rights movement, in creating rivalries among black leaders. The FBI does a, does a very effective job on all those fronts. The surveillance um, is never released. They, they, they leak it to the media, hoping newspaper reporters will, will publish the details of King's sexual affairs. Um, reporters don't do that. But nevertheless, it affects the way the media covers him, because all of these writers now know about King's moral Flaws, as the FBI would, would put it, um, I guess um, that's fair to say. And, and it affects the way the newspapers cover him. And, and we, those reporters pat themselves on the back for not printing a story of King's sex life, but they also didn't print the bigger story, which was that our government was surveilling private citizens. Um, but just to get back to the terrible irony, we can't listen to those tapes yet. We only have transcripts. The tapes are scheduled to be released in 2027. But we can read the transcript of King's conversations with his friends, with his advisors, with his lawyers, with his wife. And we can see how sad he was. Even when we read the transcripts of him talking to women he's having affairs with, it's sad. We see how lonely he is. And we see how frustrated he is that his work isn't going well, that he's constantly being undermined by the media, by other black leaders. He can't understand why no one's listening to him. He actually says, this is Martin Luther King Jr. And he's saying, I don't, it feels like no one's listening to me anymore. And on the day after his, what I consider his greatest speech, April 4th, 1967, um, at Riverside Church, the Beyond Vietnam speech, in which he says that the greatest purveyor of, of violence on earth is the United States government. My own government. My own government. My own government. Um, the next day, he gets a call from one of his best friends and closest advisors, Stan Levison, who um, in many ways more radical than King was um, a few years earlier. And he says, I didn't like that speech. It didn't sound like you, and it's really going to hurt us. It's 
going to damage our fundraising. It's going to damage. We're going to lose a lot of white liberal supporters. Um, we're going to have no chance of getting anything done with President Johnson at this point. And King, we know exactly what he says. The transcripts are accurate. Um, Levison listened to the trans, read the transcripts himself, and said that's exactly what we said. King says to one of his closest, longest friends, "Don't you know me? Don't you know that?" I don't care whether what I said was politically correct because I know it was morally correct. And for King to have to explain himself to, like that to one of his closest friends, it's just heartbreaking. And that's, that's the power of those transcripts for me. And it is ironic because some people I've spoken to, especially like young audience members when I talk about the book, they say, well, why did you print the FBI transcripts? Those are dirty. You know, that's corrupt material. We shouldn't be spying on King anymore. Maybe it was morally incorrect for me to use those transcripts, but I think that they, they humanize King in a, in a really ironic and, and tragic way. There's no question from my point of view as a reader that they do. And many of you here probably know what I'm about to say, but I was um, at once astonished and, a, and a, had a kind of, of course, feeling as I read your double disclosure that, first of all, Hoover spied on King because King had the forthrightness to state the obvious, which was that the FBI was tied in with racist law enforcement in the South, and that they couldn't be counted on to protect uh, him or his associates at all because they, uh, their closest uh, friends were the very uh, white law enforcement officials who were making trouble for blacks in the South. And then that uh, Hoover applied pressure on Robert F. Kennedy to enable the wiretaps because he said, I've got stuff on you and your brother too, so either you go after King or I'm coming after you. Right. Something like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, the level of, of, uh, of evil, really, and listen to this before we move on. Um, this is... Uh, J. Edgar Hoover after Martin Luther King is shot, but before we know the eventual outcome. I hope the son of a bitch doesn't die. If he does, they'll make a martyr out of him. That's our chief law enforcement official in this country at that time, when a public citizen has been uh, shot in cold blood. Uh, maybe that's known to everyone who knows King's story, but I, I I practically tossed the book across the room in, in a rage when I read that, and the book is, is full of this kind of, kind of material. I thought you were going to say the book is dangerous to throw across a room <laughs> because it's heavy. Um, glad that you didn't throw it. Um, I just want to say one more thing about, about Hoover is that he had a choice. He knew that King was not connected to communists. Racism was driving him more than anything else. The threat that these protesters, that these, this movement might actually change the dynamic of power in this country, that the people who had been hoarding power for so long might be forced to give up some of it. That was, he saw his job as preserving the status quo. And in some ways, he was right to recognize King as a threat in that way. King threatened his limited vision of, of what democracy should be. And that's why when King began planning the Poor People's Campaign, even though King's popularity had fallen by then, Hoover saw this as yet another threat. And he, the FBI sends out a memo in the spring of 1968, just a couple of months before the assassination, and says that Malcolm X is, is gone. We don't have to worry about him anymore. King is the only one left who could become the messiah of the black people. And we must do everything in our power to see that that doesn't happen. And that memo goes out to every bureau office in the country. So people ask me, um, I'm sorry if I'm pre precluding the, the first question of the Q&A, but people ask me, do you think that he was, the assassination was a conspiracy? And I say, no, it was intentional. The government created the conditions in which they knew King would become a target. Um, that's not a conspiracy, that's overt. And that memo um, makes it clear that they're sending a message that we should treat this guy not as someone we should protect because he'd already been, he was getting death threats constantly. The FBI could have taken a different position and said, this is somebody we need to make sure 
nothing happens to him because this country's going to explode if anything happens to Martin Luther King. But no, the opposite was their approach. The, op the approach was, he's a threat, and um, we must do everything possible to disrupt him. The, the two previous books had uh, struck religious notes in their titles, Burying the Cross by David J. Garrow, and um, Taylor Branch's first volume is called Parting the Waters, you know, reference to Moses. And yours is King, a life. Did you directly or explicitly um, tack away from the, uh, a metaphorical approach and, and choose to do something different? Yeah, um, first of all, those titles, as you just demonstrated, are sometimes hard to remember. <laughs> uh, Let the Trumpet Sound is the other one by Stephen Oates. Uh, they're all terrific books, they're all terrific titles. But my goal here was to write a book that was in some ways the the inverse of the Branch and the, and the Garrow books. Those are giant works of history with King running through them. I wanted to write a book with King at the center, a much more intimate portrait. I wanted to write a book that would make people cry when they got to the end. And that meant focusing on King and sometimes not covering every rally or every speech or um, even every important character that could have been in the book, because I wanted you to feel like you understood we're getting to know King and the civil rights movement secondarily. So calling it King and putting a big picture of his face on the cover is a signal that you're getting something different here. You're getting a just a, it, in many ways, similar story, but a totally different perspective than you got from those other books. It's so striking because usually we get things in the other direction. You get the, the life first and then the life and times later. And so you, you, you know, reverse the order. Let me just read a passage that gives a sense of this, the intimate portrait of King. King was a man, not a saint, not a symbol. He chewed his fingernails. He shouted at the TV during quiz shows. He hid his cigarettes from his children. He had a little white dog named Topsy. He bore a scar on his chest where, in 1958, surgeons extricated an ivory-handled letter opener lodged beside his aorta. He had skin so sensitive he couldn't use a razor. He slept poorly, but napped well. He ran chronically late for meetings. As an adolescent, he twice attempted suicide, although perhaps half-heartedly. As an adult, he was hospitalized repeatedly for what he called exhaustion, and others described as depression. He possessed a wicked sense of humor, improved by the knowledge that certain jokes were funnier coming from a Baptist minister. And that, that flair for the particular uh, really runs through the book. And, and, it, and it, makes, um, it makes a real difference. He really, it, he lives in this book, and it's, it's um, very hard to do. Well, thanks, and I should say that paragraph that you just read from is probably the one that I sweated the most. <laughs> I spent so much time on that trying to get it just right. But what I felt like I had to do here was undo some of the effect of the King holiday and the King monument and the thousand Martin Luther King streets and the 100 Martin Luther King public schools in this country, because when we monumentalize someone in that way, when we put them up on a pedestal, we lose sight of their, of their flesh and blood. And I think it's been one of the great unintended consequences of the King holiday. And I have to tell you that some people I interviewed, like Harry Belafonte and Reverend Lawson and Dr. Bernard Lafayette, kind of feel like that's a conspiracy too, that the government intentionally created the holiday for King, knowing that it would sap him of his radicalism. As Belafonte said, we only like dead radicals in this country. Um, and I think there's a case to be made whether, I don't necessarily think it was intentional. I don't think Ronald Reagan was that smart in when he, that when he signed the bill that he um, knew that it would undercut King's radicalism, but I do think it, had that, it has had that effect because we, in making King accessible, we tend to focus on the parts that make us comfortable. I have a dream, content of our character. And I would like to encourage um, people who assign the I have a dream speech in classrooms to maybe wait a little longer and then assign the first half of the speech, because nobody ever reads the first half of the speech where he talks about police brutality, and he talks about reparations, and he talks about income inequality. It was a radical speech. And when he got to the end of the part that he'd written, he decided to improvise. The I Have a Dream speech was not in his plans that day. He went over his time limit, because he's Martin Luther King, and he can. 
I said, 10 minutes, come on, uh, I, I got more for you. And that's when he decided to take the crowd to church and spontaneously went into the I Have a Dream speech. And again, it may have backfired in a way. It certainly moved America that day um, and inspired a sense of hope. But it also washed out the dangerous portion of the speech that he'd given before. And, and that part of the speech didn't make the papers the next day, and it's, it's forgotten today. I want to come back to that, his use of the word genocide and uh, his um, program for reparations. Uh, but, but first, so you moved away from these metaphorical uh, approaches, religiously loaded ones, and yet there's very keen attention to, his, to belief in what it, what it meant to him and what it meant to the movement. What, did, you, did you have a deliberate approach in mind or did it emerge in the, in the writing? Yeah, you know, I, I have to say that I was kind of surprised at how religious he was. <laughs> and this might sound stupid because he's Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, right? But I was, as I researched this, I kept saying back to myself, wow, he's really religious. He really believes in this stuff. And, and it was so inspiring to me. And, and to see that somebody who kept coming back to his core beliefs, no matter how difficult they made his life, that he refused to compromise. Um, and I was really moved by that personally and, and really inspired by, by his faith. And, and you can't really understand King without understanding his faith, without understanding the, the black social gospel, without understanding what he saw his father and his grandfather do from the pulpit, how he grew up in this community where he could hop from church to church and sample different styles of preaching, and how he felt like the only way to really do what he wanted to do with his life, which was to kill Jim Crow, to fight for democracy, to, to bring his country into line, to bring the Constitution into line with the words in the Bible, um, the only way for him to do that was from the pulpit. And he said over and over again, I just wasn't listening, but he said it over and over again, that he saw his activism as an extension of his ministry, and that his job was to save souls. And it wasn't to pass legislation. His job was to save souls. So um, I was really, um, I was surprised at just, you know, as I, as I got deeper and deeper in the book, about how um, much religion was, was, was overtaking the, the, the book at times. And uh, I'll tell you, when, I, when the book came out, I did an event at the um, National Cathedral with Bishop Buddy. And she said, on, on the stage that she'd watched some of my interviews for the book and she was surprised that every time I was asked, well, what was the most important influence in King's life? My answer is Jesus. And she said, what I love about that is that it's coming from a white Jewish journalist. <laughs> and so you're objective. <laughs> so um, that means even more to me. Uh, so I appreciated that. It's also the Christianity that um, infused King's life is deep, deeply identified with nonviolence to the point where um, Christianity is a religion of nonviolence for Dr. King. And to, to be nonviolent, to be a Christian is to be nonviolent in his uh, sense of things. Right. And at the same time, he nonviolence is something like a, a a core faith for him so that when he goes to India, he says, to other countries, I go as a tourist. But because of Gandhi, when I, when I, I, I come to India as a pilgrim. So nonviolence and, and Christianity are deeply bound up together. Uh, you found that in the writing. Absolutely. And it's also an, an evolution for him. You know, when the Montgomery bus boycott begins. And it's worth noting that King was reluctant to get involved in the Montgomery bus boycott. When they first called and said, would you come to a meeting? He said, let me think about it. Those immortal words, um, Dr. King, we need you. He's not Dr. King yet, he's Reverend King. And he says, I'll think about it. He's not, he doesn't want to get involved because he's got a new church. He's got a new baby, two weeks old at home. And he gets pulled into this. And suddenly he finds himself leading this movement. And he finds just gradually that this message of nonviolence seems to resonate. The people in the pulpits, the people who are staying off the buses, are moved by this idea that we have this sense of morality about what we're doing. The, me the, min the media is attracted to this theme. So when Bayard Rustin comes down to Montgomery to see if he can help, he says, I love how you're using 
principles of nonviolence and how you're, you know, you're using the lessons of Gandhi. But it might be a good idea if you got rid of the gun that you're keeping under the pillow on your sofa, uh, if you really want to be nonviolent. And King thought about it and said, yeah, I guess you're right. So he was not you know, fully committed yet. He was learning as he went along. And I think it goes, in the beginning, it's a strategy. And it becomes a philosophy and a way of life. And he finds that, um, you know, obviously, it's rooted in Christianity. But it also connects through the philosophy that he's read in college. And then it connects through the activism and the, the, and, and the lessons of Gandhi as he, as he grows and as he continues to study. And one of the things that you convey, just through your skill, but also because it's not a life in times, is that King is a prodigy. And he learns with incredible swiftness. My experience of King isn't someone who kind of is learning as he goes. I have come to feel like he kind of knew it all, all along. But uh, this is what he said about nonviolence. And the experience in Montgomery did more to clarify my thinking on the question of nonviolence than all the books I had read. Living through the actual experience of the protest, nonviolence became more than a method to which I gave intellectual assent. It became a commitment to a way of life. So moving to think that he actually learned that from the, the people who had drafted him, really. Yeah, it's a great example of how you, know, you take these lessons, in, that you, things that you read in college, and he'd written his dissertation on, and, and then they become different when you have to apply them to your life. And he saw, you know, he'd read Howard Thurman, um, Jesus and the Disinherited, and he had read the idea that nonviolence can serve as sort of a, a, a jujitsu. It switches the power because the person who may have all the guns, the person who may have all the police at their disposal, um, are suddenly rendered weak when you show your great moral power not to fight back. When you turn the other cheek, suddenly you become their moral, moral superior. So that's a great lesson in the books. But when you're in Montgomery and you're taking these um, folks who've always been afraid to speak out and giving them the, the courage to speak out um, and showing them that they have power by protesting nonviolently, by invoking love of their enemies, um, seeing it actually work is a, different, is a very different experience. And meanwhile, he's got white racists this far away from him, calling him the worst names, lunging at him, grabbing at him. Just the idea that he could physically himself resist uh, striking back. Um, I was kind of amazed that, that that alone didn't break him. Yeah. People jostling against him. Yeah, well, there's this the critical time. moment in Montgomery just in the first weeks of the boycott when their home is bombed. You know, Martin's not home, but Coretta and the baby are at home. And the bomb blows up on their porch. And luckily, Coretta and the baby were in the back of the house. And um, when King gets home, all his neighbors are assembled around the house. And the police chief and the mayor are out there. And they're saying to King, you know, please you know, try to calm the crowd. And King um, not only urges people to go home and put away their guns um, and that remember that we are not going to answer violence with violence, he also makes the crucial decision to stay, because the next, that night, his father and Coretta's father drive to Montgomery and say, we're taking you home. And uh, that's this a point where I should mention that one of my other real priorities with this book was to give Coretta the three-dimensional portrait that she deserved and has never had. She still hasn't had a proper biography. And um, the other books that were, came out in the 80s and 90s really didn't see how important she was as much more than just a wife, but as an intellectual and activist inspiration. Um, Martin Luther King marries Coretta because she is an activist, because she has more experience as an activist than he does. When she kind of lays it on him on their first date or something yeah, like that? Yeah, the first that. date, like she says, is... what are you going to do? To, to, uh, and he says, I'm going to kill Jim Crow. And she says, well, yeah, how? <laughs> she wants the details. And she gives him books that she wants him to read. Um, and all of their life together, um, she is pushing him. When, when they get the Nobel Prize news, she says, OK, we've got more responsibilities than ever now. We've got to start speaking out on things internationally. And um, Coretta is a huge force. And it's important to note that even that night, she's the one who says, we're not going anywhere. She talks to their parents, because Martin was always a little bit afraid of his father and had a hard time standing up to him. Our greatest protest leader was averse to conflict um, when it came to personal relations. But Coretta had no problem standing up to Daddy King and saying, we're not going anywhere. 
and some of her voice emerges again because of the uh, tapes and that you now have her voice and transcripts because she was spied on, right? Yeah, not only was she spied on, but I was able, there were a lot of wonderful archival discoveries that I made. It's unbelievable to be surrounded by books. This is the most beautiful library I've ever seen, perhaps. Um, but I made so many incredible archival discoveries, in part because it had been some time since the last book. But I found the tapes that Coretta made when she went to work on her first memoir, right after the assassination. She worked with a ghostwriter. And I found the tapes that she made in the ghostwriter's collection of papers at the University of Florida. I found um, the papers of L.D. Reddick, who was King's personal archivist, boxes that had never been opened at the Schomburg Center in Harlem. I found an unpublished autobiography of Daddy King. So Martin Luther King's father wrote a book and never had it published, only two copies in the world. And the King family didn't know it existed. Um, so finding those new sources, hearing their voices for the first time in some cases, um, and giving voice to people whose stories had been overlooked for so long is one of the great you know, honors, really, of this book. To, to help give Coretta more of a voice um, is you know, just a privilege. The letter from Birmingham jail was addressed to gradualist white clergy. Um, I was born in 1965. I, my understanding is that most of the Catholic leaders were gradualists of the um, go slow type themselves. What, from all your research, what did, what did you find out about the, the place of the Catholic hierarchs in, the, in their dealings with King? Yeah, I, I can't speak specifically to the Catholics. I can just say that King was frustrated more than, perhaps more than anything, by religious people who dragged their feet, who kept saying to him, be patient. We're working on it. Give us more time. And that was what the letter from Birmingham jail was about specifically. You know, he's in jail and he reads this letter um, written by a bunch of clergy, all white clergy, saying, don't push so hard. Give us time. We're, we're with you, but we, we, you know, we have, but be reasonable. And King's response is, you know, you can't ask people who've been oppressed for so long to, to wait for justice. The time for justice is, is now. The time to do the right thing is always now. Um, so I don't know specifically about the Catholic Church. I just know that he was, he was deeply frustrated by religious figures who um, didn't see the urgency of now. King met Muhammad Ali, subject of one of your previous books. What went down that day? Well, um, you should watch it on YouTube. It's one of my favorite moments. Because yeah, you know, King is a very, always you know, presented himself very, in a very dignified way. He had a great sense of humor. He was hilarious. And um, he was a lot of fun to be around. And one of my great um, privileges in this book was just asking people, you know, just, what was it like to be around him? What did you guys do when you were bored? I just loved asking <laughs> that question. Um, but Ali's the only one who I ever saw who got King to laugh, um, like in public. They were doing a press conference together in Louisville, and um, King was there um, pushing for fair housing laws. And Ali just like dropped by at the press conference, and um, and um, the reporters were saying, were trying to, as the reporters often did back then, tried to provoke and divide black leaders, and said, well, you've criticized Dr. King for seeking integration, and you say integration is a waste of time, and Dr. King, you know, you say the Nation of Islam is, is leading Americans down a dangerous path. What did you two discuss today? And Ali just started, like, saying, oh, we had a great talk. We're like Khrushchev and Kennedy. We're the best of friends. And, uh, <laughs> and, and King just starts cracking up. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that's one of the things I loved about King as I delved into this is that he was so warm and friendly that even people who, who were criticizing him and using him, um, they ended up loving him. So Stokely Carmichael goes to march with King in Mississippi in 1966, picking up for um, James Meredith after Meredith had been shot. And Carmichael's trying to get King to say black power. He's trying it out on this march. He's trying it out to audiences. He says, it's really getting great response. Doc, doc you should try it. And King said, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say it because it sounds violent. And, um, and as they go along, um, Carmichael says, yeah, I have to apologize to you because I've really been using you for years, you know, p positioning you as the conservative and me as the radical, you know, alternative. And 
and it, you know, I hadn't really thought about how that might make you feel. And King just laughed and said, it's okay, everybody uses me for something. Um, and by the end of the trip, um, not only were they friends, but you start to see King using some of Carmichael's language. He never says black power. He won't put the two words right next to each other, but he starts using black instead of Negro a lot more. He, start, he, he starts talking about economic power, the power of the people. He's really absorbing and learning. And I think that's one of the great things. I think even Malcolm X, I think they were coming closer and closer um, over the years and that um, they had a, a great deal of respect for one another. In fact, if I can talk about one more archival discovery. This is this the Esquire transcript, please. Uh, Playboy magazine. Um, so the most, one of the things I've learned to do in, over the years is when you find a good article about your subject is you, you go to the library, you look for the archives of that interview. Maybe you can get the tapes, you can see what was in their notes, find things they left out. So the longest interview King ever did was with Alex Haley, the author of Roots, and it was for Playboy magazine. And I just wanted to see if there's anything that, obviously he didn't print everything, so I wanted to get the complete transcript, I wanted to hear the tapes. So I wrote to the library at Duke where Alex Haley's papers were kept, and I asked them to send me the transcript. And um, in this, article, in the published article, Haley asks King, what do you think about Malcolm X? And King says, I think Malcolm's fiery demagogic oratory brings nothing but grief to black, pe to black people. And when I got the transcripts, that quote wasn't in there at all. When asked what he thought about the Nation of Islam, King said, I think the Nation of Islam's fiery demagogic or oratory brings nothing but grief. When asked about Malcolm X, King said, I don't believe I have all the answers. I think Malcolm and I are both fighting for black dignity. And that while I don't approve of his calls for violence, we share many of the same goals. But they did not print that. They printed the, the more incendiary um, response because, they, I guess, because they thought it would sell more magazines or something. And King never complained about it. King was a radical. Racism is a form of genocide. It's right there in, in one of his homilies. He met Nehru when he was in India, India. He learned about the reparation program for the, uh, the untouchables in India. And he drew up, it seems like a very uh, complex and well worked out um, arrangement whereby a form of reparations would be paid to black Americans and presented it to Pre President Johnson, is that right? Right, and wrote about it extensively in, in in one of his books, really laid it out, argued for it philosophically, said, you know, people say, well, you can't put a dollar price on slavery, and he said, sure, you can. It doesn't have to be accurate. You know, we, don't, we can't assess the true value, but we can still try. That's what we do all the time in court when someone's harmed. You can't replace somebody who dies in a, in a tragic accident, but if the wrong was done, you pay whatever the, you think is appropriate. Um, but morally, you're, again, he's a minister. He's, he's, not, he's not a politician. He's interested in saving our souls. He says, we can't save the soul of this country until we deal with the sin of slavery, until we make atonement for the sin of slavery. And if you want to call it reparations, if you want to call it you know, economic compensation, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's about doing the right thing morally. And he believed the reparations were the right thing morally. And um, he also believed, inspired in part by his trip to India, that some forms of affirmative action were called for. And it's ironic that today, every time um, someone wants to uh, oppose uh, affirmative action, what do they do? They quote King's speech from the March on Washington and say, well, Dr. King obviously would have opposed, he obviously opposed affirmative action because he said we should be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. So there it is. And that's just you know, abuse of, of, of King's language. And we see it all the time. Nicole Hannah-Jones in the New York Times Magazine a couple of weeks ago laid out this, the narrative of what she calls the whitewash of the civil rights movement in terms very similar to these, that the notion of restorative, reparative justice uh, was um, eroded practically from the moment it took hold uh, by um, folks, white folks, who uh, uh, have reverted to the uh, colorblindness as an ideal and co-opted some of the language of the civil rights movement for their own purposes. Um, what, what do you make of that argument that uh, Hannah Jones spells out? Well, I think she's 
Absolutely right. And it's just using cover. And we see King used for cover more than anyone else. It's, usually it's cover for racism. Um, you know, you'll see the same line about content of our character or just the I, fact that King said, I have a dream and there's a dream of brotherhood to try to undercut his, his, his true meaning. And it's just, you know, it's, it's an empty, um, as I say, really abusive use of, of the language. And, um, and I think the ultimate irony is that um, it, it, it shows that people are just afraid of his, of his real ideas, that they're afraid to engage with him in a real way. So many people in the audience know so much about uh, Dr. King. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, mics are, I guess, on both sides. And I see um, already uh, one of my colleagues is moving around. Um, questions for Jonathan Eig? Question right up here. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, so much I want to say, but I'll narrow it down to this. You know, in Thomas Merton's book, uh, The Seven Story Mountain, he mentions that Dr. King visited him at the monastery in Kentucky, and that after that visit, they kept up um, a pretty steady correspondence. So I guess I felt like when I read that, it was an example for, of each of them having an openness to talk to people across racial lines, across denominations, across religions, which is an example for us now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and, and, and you're right that King was open to conversation in a way that we, it has, becoming, has become more and more rare today. And I think that one of the ways that we can use King, I often say that you know, we're living in a time when people are trying to restrict the teaching of black history, teaching of diversity. Um, King can be used in a positive way, again, because he's the only thing that's left in some schools where King is the only thing that um, teachers are comfortable teaching. So let's use that to teach the fact that he, he did focus on things like talking to people who make you uncomfortable. He did talk about things like reparations and police brutality. So we can, we can I think for, for teachers who are working in difficult situations right now, in difficult places, um, maybe King can help again in that way. Thank you for that question. There's such a strong uh, impression from your book about the sadness in uh, Martin Luther King's life uh, comes through so strongly. I was wondering what your thinking is that. Is that mostly from the external forces that impede him and press on him, or is it, is it something else? It's kind of a surprise, the sadness from such a faith-inspired person, and trying to put those together. What's your thought on that? That's a tough question. I think um, he was always very sensitive, as we see from those early suicide attempts when he was a teenager. And he was always very, he had a hard time, um, as I mentioned, you know, challenging his father. So I think there was a, there's a, a ribbon of sadness running through his life. Um, but the pressures that he was under were just so, so unimaginable. I, I don't know how, you know, you get up in the morning knowing that the death threats are constant and, and, and real. Um, you know, he was stabbed in the chest. Um, he, his home was shot at three times. Um, he was arrested 29 times. Um, to deal with that and to, to keep going is, is incredible. And I think you know, he clearly found support and found strength in, in his faith in God and that he was called to do this work and that there was no alternative for him. But that doesn't make you immune to the feelings. And, and he was human and, and he struggled um, just to get through the day sometimes and, you know, struggled to sleep almost every night of his life. Can I add something there? Yeah. Because your book is so co relatively compact, we get a sense, or I got a sense of, you know, one day the f people in Montgomery just said, we, we need you for this boycott. You know, he was just living his life. They, they choose him and it does not let up. He, there's no looking back, there's no pause. He, when he, learned that he'd won the Nobel Prize, he was in the hospital, right. uh, which is practically the only place he could get any rest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, because your book is so tight, you get this, the relentless quality of, of his calling really comes through. And Steve, I could really feel that as a, as a so source for, for the sadness that you're, um, that, that you're touching on, I think. 
Yeah, I kept wishing that he would take a sabbatical. He was offered a sabbatical a year before his assassination from Riverside Church, and he turned it down. He just, he, he knew too many people were counting on him, and he, and he believed that God called him to this work. And sabbatical just felt like, a, I guess, like um, selfish, I think. I think it, So um, I had a media question for you. As you were talking about uh, the newspapers not publishing the, um, the transcripts but missing the bigger story, I was wondering why, uh, if J. Edgar Hoover had released those kind of data to southern newspapers, which were quite racist at the time, and why those reporters might not have uh, published it. And then secondly, I was wondering what you think if we were in a media situation like today, with social media, you know, uh, highly partisan in a different fashion, if things would have evolved in a different way? Great question. Um, I, they, they certainly did release that to Southern papers, and Ralph McGill at the Atlanta Constitution was one reporter that they felt like they could rely on to, uh, to do their bidding, but the papers still wouldn't print it. And I think it's in part because the standards of the day were different. There was a sense that we have to protect the privacy of public figures because our mayor and our quarterback are doing the same kind of thing, <laughs> and, if, and, and, and we, ha we certainly have to protect them. So somehow the lion was held for king. Um, today, I think that's part of the reason why we don't see moral leaders emerging is that you, you have to know that your, laundry's going, your dirty laundry is going to be aired today if you, if you dare to seek um, a public position, if you dare to try to lead a movement. And, you know, that's, I don't know that King could have survived in this environment. Um, certainly wouldn't, those, those affairs would not have remained private today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the book. Um, two biggies in my looking at the book. Muhammad Ali decides no to Vietnam. Did they ever talk about that um, formally, extensively over time, one? And two, Coretta, would you like to do the book on Coretta? Because <laughs> she really emerges as uh, a power figure, and I, I think you did a terrific job. Thank you. Um, I don't think that King and Ali spent a lot of time together. I know they did talk about Vietnam, and, and that was the one thing they had in common because um, they certainly didn't um, share you know, views on the civil rights movement. Uh, but um, as for Coretta, I would only do it if I found the blue suitcase. She kept a blue suitcase under her bed with all of the private letters, and those letters have not been released to the King Center archives. They are not available to the public yet. And if, if those letters were, I assume that the, one of her two surviving children must have those letters. Um, if those letters were released, um, somebody would then be, I think, would be in a good position, whether it's me or somebody else. Uh, thank you. Th this is somewhat related. Um, Martin Luther King, in a sense, was one of the early critics of the Vietnam War, I think. And yeah. Turning against Johnson, who was had done so much, you know, to move things forward legislatively, and do you think that that was um, part part of the uh, government action against him? And uh, do you, I mean, is there evidence of that? Was that discussed? Yeah, there's no question about that. And let's, I should also point out that Coretta was ahead of King on on speaking out on Vietnam, um, so she deserves credit there again. But um, King and Johnson had this really terrific relationship in the, in the early years. And we can listen to the recordings of many of their calls. Um, you can too, just go to the LBJ library online. And um, in the beginning, he, he calls him Martin and, and they're really conferring on policy issues. They have this unbelievable discussion when, when King is in LA uh, and Watts is on fire and, and King is reporting to Johnson what he's seeing there and saying, you don't understand, this is not an isolated incident. There's a reason why Black people um, in this town and in many other towns have a problem with the police. And there's a reason why um, they're upset about the lack of housing and discrimination in jobs. And that's all behind this conflagration. And Johnson seems to be interested in what can we do to address these core issues. And the relationship just gets worse and worse over time. 
in part because Johnson is being fed this information on King's personal life uh, by a J. Edgar Hoover, and Johnson is encouraging Hoover to keep sending him more and more of this. He seems to be enjoying the salacious nature of it. But he uh, routes it around through a secretary or something? He, he, I discovered this, actually, David Garrow said to me, Garrow, a lot of the previous King scholars were just enormously helpful um, to me and gave me advice, nobody more than David Garrow, who said, have you thought about checking the papers of LBJ's secretary, Mildred Stiegel? And I hadn't even heard of Mildred Stiegel, but it turns out that she kept all of the most sensitive papers in her safe, including the tapes and including um, the um, president's financial documents and all of the personal letters that came from J. Edgar Hoover to LBJ were in Mildred Stiegel's files and nobody had requested them ever. I had to get them declassified. Um, even Robert Caro, I guess, hadn't been through them yet. Wow. So I'm hoping Caro gets to that. Um, but um, it was amazing because you could see that Hoover was writing about King's personal life, not just his sex life, but about what magazine articles King was working on, sometimes two or three times a week, directly to the president. And, Hoover, and Johnson was keeping those letters in his safe, and he was encouraging Hoover to disseminate this information to the press and suggesting questions that they should get reporters to ask King to try to embarrass him. So it was, the relationship clearly deteriorated in part not just because of Vietnam, but that was a large part. It was also because King was beginning to speak out more on Northern racism and segregation and, and um, going to places like Chicago. And that was, and Johnson was afraid of losing black votes in, in these strongholds, Democratic strongholds. And um, King was, again, once again, just not concerned with politics. I think anyone else would have said to LBJ, hey, we're having this great conversation. I'm really helping you here in LA, right? By the way, do me a favor and get J. Edgar Hoover off my back. It would make my life a lot easier, right? I think anyone else would have would have asked for a little favor. You've got the president. You could got ask the president. Him. He he needs you right now, and but King didn't know how to talk. He didn't understand the language of politics. He wasn't interested in it. It was, I think, it was probably like morally disgusting to him, and um, and I think Johnson would have respected King. For asking that, because that would have been they would have been speaking the same language. Transactional politics. Yeah. Language, yeah. Yeah. Question in the back and one in the front. Hi, um, I'm a student here in Georgetown, so I want to turn the question to a side of more like politics and policy. I guess you can say that um, Dr. King was very successful in you know fighting for human rights or racism issue, but since you see the George Floyd and police brutality, you can say that the fight against racism is not really successful in a way. I guess kind of a suggestion to leaders or political politicians or policy maker and your research on Dr. King, what can be giving as you know future diplomats or policy maker that we need to address to solve this kind of racism issues? And, uh, race issues in America? Well, I don't know that I can answer yeah. the, uh, if I could answer that, I would be uh, doing more than writing books. But I would say this, I think um, you hit on it earlier, King's great power, I believe, was that he spoke across divisions. He had this amazing message that linked patriotism and religious faith, love of our neighbors. It was just very hard to argue with these moral, with his moral vision, so that he forced people to rethink their values, and he encouraged us to, like, think about others rather than just ourselves, and this almost seems naive today, um, but I hope it's not. I hope that that message might still resonate and that we might have a leader again who, you know, inspired us, but the bottom line is you have to just keep trying. I think that's the thing that, you know, I end my book with a quote from King saying that, we must never lose ultimate hope, that we must adapt to change and stay awake and keep fighting no matter how dark it may seem at times. And it certainly seems hopeless right now at times, but if King could maintain that kind of a, a hope, then I think we sure can too. The question in the front row. Thank you. Uh, I'm a pastor, and one of the reasons I went to seminary is because of the letter. If you could speak more about that. Uh, 
he had always talked about retaining the, uh, uh, I guess, the power of the white population because he felt he needed them for the change. But that letter was uh, a condemnation of the white uh, clergy. Did he take his time in processing that letter? Because my understanding is it took him almost a week to come up with that letter. Can you talk more about that? Yes. Um, you know, so he's in jail in Birmingham, having been arrested in a protest. And um, he begins realizing that he's always said that he feels like his message resonates more when he's in jail, that people listen to him more when he's in jail. And this is something that you know Gandhi inspired, too, in a way, right? The hunger strikes, whatever you can do to call attention to your message, um, to focus it, because he's been preaching the same message for 10 years at this point. But he realizes that jail provides him with an opportunity to, to clarify and to, and to speak to a bigger audience. So he begins writing, most people know this story, but on newspaper margins. So he's, he's really piecing it together and he's drawing on things he's written in the past and on sermons he's given in the past. So if you, if you, probably if you ran it through um, chat, G, G, chat GPT and asked it to analyze, you'd see that there's lots of sources. This is not entirely an original composition, but that's what preachers do, right? They, 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 they make collages. And um, in fact, I interviewed the woman, his secretary, who typed the letter as it was coming out of the jail on hand, sandwich wrappers and on toilet paper and on newspaper margins, Willie Pearl Mackey King, um, who lives in Virginia, not too far from here. Um, and I said, did you save that stuff? Did you save the scraps? And she said, oh, God, no, it was disgusting. <laughs> I said, you, you could be living in Hawaii right now if you'd save those scraps. It'd be <laughs> worth a fortune. Um, but um, I think because he was in jail and because he was writing it out, in, but he was boiling with anger too. So um, that having that time to really compose his thoughts, and then he edited it once it was out of once he was out of jail too. Um, but I think it's really it, what makes it so powerful is that it's a summary of of his faith and his frustrations with others who claim to to devote their lives to their, to their belief in God. And, um, and, and just, I think he said this often that it's, it's easier to deal with somebody who's honest with you. When, when, when the, when the clan member shouts at you and calls you the N word, you know who you're dealing with, but people of faith frustrated him more because they pretended to be allies. Did he lose them? Yeah. He lost a lot of them. Um, when he goes to Chicago, I'd say, Half of the religious, of the black um, religious leaders are not marching with him, in part because Reverend Jackson, not Jesse Jackson, Reverend John Jackson in, in, in Chicago is, um, is a rival and wants to see King fail. Um, but yeah, he lost some of them for sure. Let's have these two last questions, one here and one, the, one there. Um, so I'm wondering if you uh, dealt with some of the um, movements and forces that were not uh, directly, closely associated with King, but were inspired by him in his own lifetime, of which he was aware. And this, uh, by the way, sp my question specifically speaks to one of these people who was a, a Catholic um, priest who was inspired by King. I'm from Milwaukee, and there were open housing marches in Milwaukee in the late 60s, led by Father James Grappi, who turned the NAACP, of all organizations, into a militant nonviolent group. He created this uh, group called the NAACP Youth Commandos. These were teenagers, some of them were in my high school, who, mm. who in a peaceful way policed these daily demonstrations for open housing marches. And um, when the mayor of Milwaukee, Henry Meyer, tried to stop these marches, uh, King sent Grappi um, a letter saying, we support your movement. Um, and uh, so I'm just, uh, that, that's an example of a Catholic who took the letter from the Birmingham jail um, message seriously. Yes, and I think it's worth noting, and, and again, my book is tr attempting to be an intimate portrait, so I don't go on too many tangents, but there were lots of people like that who were inspired, and I shouldn't say that everybody um, was, a, was a source of disappointment and frustration. There were many people like Grappi, and there were many people, um, black and white, um, of all different religions who were inspired by King, and I think you see in the aftermath of the 60s a lot of these movements growing, even, you know, some of the women's rights movements, the gay rights movements, all of them are, are growing in, in the Black Panthers and 
you know, a lot of them are, are inspired by King, um, and they're just taking it, um, the battle to their own fronts. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I've got two questions. The first one, if you could sit down with King now, what would you want to ask him in a one-on-one -on -one interview? And then secondly, having spent so much of your time invested in his life, have you been moved or changed yourself after having done so much research and been trying to understand his life? Yeah, um, good questions, and thanks for making, giving me an easy off-ramp here. <laughs> um, you know, if I could sit down with King, I would just, I'd probably just say, why didn't you take that sabbatical in the last year? Like, tell me, tell me what you felt. Um, you know, why did you feel like you still had to keep going? You know, I know that for me, it would have been a hundred times where I would have said, okay, I've done enough. You take it from here. I, you know, someone else can, can have a shot at this. I just don't think I would have had the, the courage, the conviction, the, the calling to give my life that way that, that he did. So that, I'd want to explore that with him as much as I could. Um, and I guess that kind of reflects on how I, it's changed me. You know, if you think about, if I, I think about that, I'm somewhat religious. Um, I've been in church a lot more than I've been in synagogue this year, my rabbi will tell you. But I consider myself a, you know, a person who wants, who, who believes that we're all children of God and that we all have a responsibility to make the world better in whatever way we, we can. And it's just made me reflect on what I'm doing with my time and how I can be a part of that, even if it's a small part. Not, I'm certainly not going to do it at a Kingian level, but we all have to do the, whatever we can. So I feel, that, I feel that more seriously than I ever did before. Amen to that. I just have one quick one. I work here at the University in Athletics, so I just want to kind of maybe shift it to sports, because some of your book on Luke Garrick, Jackie Robinson, mm -hmm. uh, Muhammad Ali, Jackie Robinson, probably our most underrated athlete in American sports. I would Base, agree. Baseball is probably a sport, best sport. Uh -huh. And his older brother was probably a better athlete than Jackie yeah. Robinson. He's about 10 years older than, than Dr. King. Right. Muhammad Ali's about 12 or 13 years younger than Dr. King. Right. All tremendous bravery, courage, grit, all produced under unbelievable circumstances. Like our athletes at Georgetown, they get heckled and booed, but they heckled Robinson with hate. Yeah. And he, the book he wrote about his rookie year and his level of production. Uh, what are the similarities of who is Dr. King more like? Jackie Robinson. <laughs> Great question. My question to you is, which one would you rather have have dinner with or have a beer with? Um, Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson. I think Jackie Robinson was the least fun of those three. Jackie Robinson was a pill. Um, <laughs> it, unbelievably courageous, but n not fun to hang out with. I'm afraid. Um, yeah. He's. Oh my God. They're all heroic, off the charts. But I, I guess their stories really weave together beautifully um, because Robinson. Born in 1890? No, uh, anyway, uh, see, I'm bad at math. But anyway, um, Robinson comes along in 1947 while King is still in high school and shows that, and it's right after World War II, 1947, when, when black people are coming back from the war and saying, you know, we're not going to take it anymore. We're, we, we've just fought and died for democracy. We come back to something much less than democracy on our own land. Um, Robinson inspires people like King to think about what they can do, that they can fight. And certainly true for Ali, too. Um, so there's this great line, and we forget how young King was, that you know he was only 26 when he started leading the Montgomery bus boycott. So Jackie Robinson comes down and starts helping right away. And, and Robinson's a hero. Like King's in awe of Robinson. So these three men overlap you know, in, in amazing ways. And it's one of the things that I've had to learn. I'm not a historian by training, um, but you tend to think of these stories in isolation and they're not. You know, King is able to do, he's able to, to lead sit-ins and lead marches because of what Jackie Robinson has done. And the fact that Muhammad Ali comes along and says, you're wasting your time. White people are never going to give black people anything in this country. We gotta take it, we've gotta demand it, we've gotta like maybe leave this country uh, behind and, form our own nation, right? All of this stuff is, is connected and their lives are connected in fascinating ways. And I just love the fact that they were actually, they were all together. Um, so maybe you could have had 
dinner or beers with all three of them. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm learning just listening to you. Uh, <laughs> the book is for sale outside. Uh, and again, thank you to the Berkeley Center. Thank you to President Joya. And thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, and uh, we'll continue the conversation uh, uh, outside those doors. <laughs>